Do do you believe in evolution? I believe in uh, well, that, that's a. I believe in micro evolution. I believe that there are real evolutionary processes. I'm skeptical about what's called universal common descent, the idea that all living forms have evolved from one single common ancestor. I'm profoundly skeptical, uh, skeptical about co- chemical evolution, the idea that the uh, non-living chemicals in a prebiotic ocean or prebiotic soup arrange themselves to form the first living cell. In this powerful Joe Rogan podcast episode, Dr. Stephen Meyer dives into the deep flaws of Darwinian evolution. He discusses why random mutation and natural selection may not explain the complexity of life, challenges chemical evolution, and explores the role of genetic information. If you've ever questioned where life truly began, this conversation will open your eyes to the scientific debate. Do you, do you believe in evolution? I believe in uh, well, that, that's a. I believe in microevolution. I believe that there are real evolutionary processes. I'm skeptical about what's called universal common descent, the idea that all living forms have evolved from one single common ancestor. I'm profoundly skeptical, uh, skeptical about co- chemical evolution, the idea that the uh, non-living chemicals in a prebiotic ocean or prebiotic soup arrange themselves to form the first living cell. And I'm also skeptical about the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism, which, as it happens, uh, so are many leading evolutionary biologists today. I attended a conference in 2016 at the Royal, convened by the Royal Society uh, in London, uh, Royal Society being the oldest and most august scientific body in the world. And it was con- convened by a group of evolutionary biologists who were essentially dissatisfied with neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we learn in um, in all high school and college textbooks, and, and many of them were saying, we need a new theory of evolution. The first talk at that conference was given by Gerd Muller, a prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist, and he simply enumerated the f- five major, uh, what he called explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. And his basic perspective was, the mutation selection mechanism does a good job of, of uh, optimizing or modifying pre-existing forms Um, it can generate small-scale variation, but it does a very poor job of explaining the origin of those forms. Think about, for example, Darwin's finch beaks. Great job of explaining how variations in weather patterns result in changes in the shape and structure of the finch beaks. But that mechanism turns out not to do a good job of explaining the origin of birds or other major animal groups in the first place. So, uh, Modification, yes. Innovation, no. So but modification over massive amounts of time, don't you think that would eventually lead to new groups? Because mm-hmm. a lot of new groups have they have similar origins, or at least origins from uh, one ancestor. Well, time, like primates. Was, yeah, time was always the hero of the plot. But l- let me the, there couple, let me just run okay. a, a couple of arguments by you, and let's see, okay. see what you think. Okay, and I, I develop these in a lot of detail in my book Darwin's Doubt. Um, uh, if we th- we uh, we now know, thanks to the genetic revolution, the the molecular biological revolution, that if you want to build a new form of life, you have at least ha- you have to have new code, because all all new forms of life depend upon uh, new anatomical, a, a fundamentally new type uh, type of animal, for example. Um, so you need new anatomical structures from, but the new anatomical structures require new cell types, new types. So if you got animals that first come on the line have, and they have they have a digestive system, they have a gut. Well, you got to have enzymes that can service a gut that can process food. So enzymes are types of proteins. Proteins are built from the informational code in DNA. So anytime you want to get a new, it's just like in the computer world. If you want to give your computer a new function you've got to provide new code. So um, we have these long string, these long digital bit strings, uh, A, C's, G's, and T's, not zeros and ones, but A, C's, G's, and T's in a, in, a, in, a, in a digital string. And we call that a gene. And if you have a, a section of DNA for building a protein, that's great, all works. Now, but if you want to build a fundamentally new form of life, you've got to have, you got to have new proteins to service the new cell types to build the new anatomical structures. Um, in our computer world, we know that if you start randomly changing the zeros and ones in a section of genetic, in a section of digital code, you're going to degrade 
the function of that code long before you come up with a new string for making a new program or operating system. That the, the functional sequences are what are, they're called, they're highly isolated in what's called sequence space. You, you, you can change a few things and still retain function, but after ver a very few number of changes, you're going to degrade the function, and long before you come up with a new function. Now, the Darwinian mechanism um, starts with the idea that there are random changes in those, uh, in those digital bit strings, those sequences of A's, C's, G's, and T's. And based on our experience in the computer world, we would expect that random changes are going to, again, degrade those strings long before they're capable of building a new protein. And there's now very compelling experimental evidence that that's true. There's an Israeli um, molecular biologist, Dan Tofik. Unfortunately, he died fairly recently in a tragic accident. But he was doing uh, mutagenesis experiments on sequences of the, uh, on sequences of code for building specific proteins that fold it into stable structures. Called, they're actually called protein folds. And he found that between three and 15 mutations was enough uh, to degrade the thermodynamic stability of the protein structure that, that the, 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 the gene was making. And once you lose that thermodynamic stability, you, there's no, you, you have no uh, functional possibilities. Is there possibly an undiscovered mechanism for protecting against that that we're not aware of yet? Possibly, but there's n numerous lines of evidence suggesting that you, that mutations are are within limits. They're going. You can modify again. You can optimize a, an existing protein structure called a fold. But if you t if you allow too many of those mutations, you're going to degrade. And long before you would get a fundamentally new protein structure, an, another protein fold. So that's, that's just one of many. I want to run one other argument by you that I think is very intuitive. Um, the, if you want to build, uh, it turns out that there are, are, um, there, there are structures or systems for building n that are uh, very important for building new animal body plants. And they're called developmental gene regular, regulatory networks. They were they were discovered at Caltech uh, by Eric Davidson and colleagues. Eric Davidson has also unfortunately recently passed away in the last few years. But what these are, what, what they discovered is that you not only have genes for building proteins, you have genes that are building uh, that for for uh, constructing molecules that send signals that tell the genome when to express other parts of itself. So you've got si there's signaling molecules that are telling the genome when, when to turn this part or that part on in order to build the right proteins at the right time as new cells are going through cell division in the process of animal development. So if you go from one cell to two to four to eight to 16, et cetera. This Joe Rogan podcast featuring Steven Meyer offers a fascinating perspective on evolution. Meyer thoughtfully challenges mainstream ideas about universal common descent and the creative power of mutation and natural selection. His focus on the limits of neo-Darwinism and the complexity of genetic regulatory networks adds depth to the conversation. It's refreshing to hear a critical but respectful view that encourages us to think more deeply about how life's diversity really came to be. If you enjoy content like this, please like, share, and subscribe. Your support helps us bring more insightful discussions and deep dives into fascinating scientific topics. Don't forget to comment your thoughts below. Let's keep the conversation going.